the best thing that he told me is like, find who you want to help and just go help them. And so I'm like in my first class of my master's, I'm like, I know nothing. And he's like, go find someone and start helping them. And so I'm like, okay, like I love surfing and I see the need. So I go down to Huntington beach, you know, while there's a contest going on, I'm just like, okay, I'm just going to start talking to people. And so I did. And, um, you know, met this awesome guy named Brad Edinger who, you know, sponsored by Hurley at the time. And he's just like this awesome guy. So long story short, he gives me his number and the next three years were spent working with world-class professional surfers. It was weird because I felt like an imposter. I'm like learning stuff on Tuesday, teaching it on Wednesday. You're listening to the Reed Fletcher podcast. I had Chris Pierce on the show today. Now, Chris is an awesome guy. He is an expert in mental toughness. He has a decade of coaching mental toughness to pro surfers, special ops soldiers, and army rangers. He now coaches mental toughness to -to door-to-door salesmen. He holds a master's in sports psychology from California State University, Fullerton. Awesome guy, cool mindset, a lot of cool experience. He talks about even how he's lost weight, the mental toughness aspect of his diet, um, the the mindset he's had for success and all that kind of stuff. So I hope you enjoy the show. Check out his Instagram, Sales Resilience, uh, and I hope you enjoy. Yeah. So me too. So I served my mission and then came back and it was just like not a priority. Yeah. And like, I, I love surfing. And so at that same time, surfing kind of transitioned to like, you could watch it. Mm-hmm. Whereas before it was like, you'd kind of hear about it and you'd see it in magazines or whatever, but it transitioned so you could watch it online. And so I was like, oh yeah. Okay. Leave baseball. <laughs> like I'm just going to follow the surfing. And, um, so I totally get that. That's awesome. Surfing. I, uh, I think we talked about this. We just got back from Maui two weeks ago and I'm like watching the surfers and just thinking, man, that would be so awesome to have that skill set in my arsenal. I think it's so cool. It's a fun skill set, but it's like such an addictive behavior that's like controls the rest of your life. (laughs) Yeah. And so it's, I mean, it's good and it's a, it's something that I love, but it's also at the same time of like, sometimes it just steals so much time. Yeah. I'm, I'm realizing that now how many of the things that I used to do as a kid or whatever, how they were set up in such an addictive way, you know, like, like right. the little shots of <laughs> dopamine that you get. Yeah. Um, I didn't realize like basketball, you're like, you, you go out, you, ha- you have to work for it. And then when there's a perfect swish and you make a basket, it's like, oh, a little shot of dopamine. I don't want to, I want another one. I want another one. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I can you imagine surfing. More. Yeah. I, I, I can imagine surfing be even worse because like you can't get up and you're trying to get up. And then when you finally do, it's just like such a rush. Yeah. It's yeah. And then you start to get better. And so it, it shifts from like learning the new skill to, I don't know, to like, like, like the swish, you know, it's like, oh, I can do that again, you know, and then you start doing turns and then you start like, oh, now I can push it to surf bigger waves and like smaller boards. And like, mm-hmm. and then it becomes like, oh, you become friends with a shaper. And so then you're like, oh, I, what do you think I should ride? And it's like this whole world. Yeah. And then it becomes like, there's a whole culture behind it. <laughs> it uh-huh. just, just like takes over, you know? Yeah, honestly, but. I love that feeling of, uh, I, 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 I love the feeling of getting better at something and feeling like you're mastering it and getting that little dopamine of like, like same thing with sales, you know, like yeah. you go out and you're like, what am I doing? And you get a lucky one every once in a while. And you're like this rush, uh, <laughs> of, oh man, I'm, I'm a sales genius. And then slowly like, the rush of getting a sale goes down because you get better at it, but you get a different rush because you feel like, like you're starting to get it. You're starting to master it. And it's an yeah. all new addiction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it, yeah, it, it really is. And like with surfing, like, I mean, I'm currently in Georgia. We'll be 
in back in Hawaii, you know, in the next month. And it's funny because there's like different breaks too. So it's like, okay, there's different boards that you can write, but then there's different breaks. And I imagine like selling has like different neighborhoods and it's kind of these, I don't know, these little nuances of it mm -hmm. that I don't know, just shift your, your focus into like, okay, I'm going to master this new thing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> I think that's like a personality trait. Like some people, and I include myself in this, just love that feeling of, of working to perfect something. You know, it's, it's yeah. not being perfect at something. It is the feeling that you are getting more perfect. Like you're, you've got, you know, like the, the big piece of clay and you're slowly, you know, rounding the edges till you have a perfect statue. And I, I absolutely love that feeling. Um, I think that the, the pursuit is what makes things fun, you know, like, yeah. because when you get the payoff, it's great, but it's just like, it pays off. And then you're like, Oh, I want, <laughs> I want the pursuit again. You know? Yeah. It's funny. I, I think about, Okay. So I went surfing and it was this perfect day. It was just like this spot called V land. And it's just kind of like a, like a skate park of a wave, you know, like it just breaks in the same spot. It's, it's not going to kill you. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was so excited to get out this day. And, and so I get out there, catch my first wave and I like hit a fin on the reef, like ripped it out. I was just like, no. <laughs> and, and so I run home and the only other board that I had, like, that was like, it's funny. Cause like living in Hawaii, I've got all these boards, but I ended up taking out this friend's board that was not what you would want to ride in that uh -huh. situation. Like a very round kind of board, a single fin. So you know, I'm typically on a thruster, which means it's got three fins. It's like a standard short board. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden I find myself, I'm like, well, I don't care. I'm going and I'm going to master this like six, six round nose, single fin, not ideal. And I'll have to, I'll send you this photo that I have from the, from that day that there was a photographer out and I had one of the funnest waves of my life. Um, on this board that was not ideal. Mm -hmm. And I, I think a lot of times we look at our situations as maybe being not ideal. And a lot of times we avoid it and we stop and we're just like, Oh, I don't have the perfect conditions. And so I'm just going to like, you know, sit on the beach and watch. Mm -hmm. Whereas that day it was like such a highlight because it was like, I was still able to maximize in less than ideal conditions. Mm -hmm. So I had to work a lot harder to make it happen. Um, and I think that, you know, not only applies to, to surfing into other sports, but also applies to everything. Um, you know, how often do salespeople, you know, get out and I don't know, like they, they have low energy or they missed out on their morning routine. They had a poor breakfast, right? Like people are extra mean. It's a crappy area. Like you name it, all the excuses mm -hmm. that people use, just put forth more effort and maximize it in less than ideal conditions, you know, and who knows what's going to happen. You might have a day like I had out at VLAND where I had one of the best sessions of my life on a weird board that I'd never ridden before. Yeah. You know, and, and so you could have that, but I think we, we fall into these assumptions where we think like, I don't have this and I don't have that. And all these things are against me, blah, 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 blah. And then if you go out and do it anyway, put forth extra effort, then you have this magical day and you mm -hmm. have this magical experience. Maybe you don't, but the magic then comes in the effort that you put forth and that you were able to do it anyway. And it, at minimum have an average day, yeah. you know, but, but the, the likelihood is there is a chance at least to have an amazing day and to do something that maybe you've never done before. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And I, uh, I, 
it makes sense, right? Like there's a cycle, uh, a self kind of perpetuating cycle that happens where things aren't exactly right. I used to see this on my mission too. And I thought it was so funny because uh, same exact thing with sales, like, hey, well, I didn't have a good breakfast, or I don't feel good, or my stomach hurts, or the area is bad, or it's too hot, or like a million things, right? You can always find something. And so they don't go out. And it feels good to not go out. You know, it's like, <laughs> right. it's like reinforcement. <laughs> it's like a drug to not work. And so they're like, okay, so now in their brain, they're making a connection between, okay, if I have an excuse, I get rewarded. I get to not go out. And so now it feels good to have an excuse. They're like, does my foot hurt? I mean, I think maybe it hurts. And they're like, they have every incentive in their own brain to want their foot to hurt. And so like, it just, it's just the cycle again. Yeah. And so they well, just don't go about, out. Talking about the dopamine hits earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you find excuses and those excuses get you that, that dopamine hit instead mm -hmm. of the, the sales. And so you're, you're switching, you know, and it's going to only cause damage. You know, you're getting dopamine hits on things that are causing frustration and damage in your life that are taking you like stopping all your momentum. You know, you're trying to push a hill, a car up the hill. And now you're just like, whoa riding it backwards yeah you know, oh you know and you're and you're becoming the victim and and searching for any of those opportunities yeah and i think the the feeling that you get like the the good quote-unquote feeling you get from not working or from not going out versus the also good feeling you get from going out they're they're very different you know they're not mm. like yeah when using the summer sales as an example, like it is a good feeling to be at home and like, I'm so glad I'm not out there, you know, getting rejected or walking in the heat. It is a good feeling. Um, it's like a, like candy, you know, yeah. and that's kind of what it feels like. Cause it's like a, a shallow kind of like a sweet taste in your mouth where you're like, Oh sweet. I don't have to do that thing. But the good feeling that you get from, going out there, like the feeling of satisfaction from tired legs and crusty sweat and five sales at the end of the day or, or whatever it is, yep. um, that feeling is not as sweet like candy, but it's a deeper satisfaction. You feel good about who you are in yeah. a deeper sense. Well, and I think something that often happens is people, they, they don't tap into that feeling Whereas candy is much more apparent, whereas doing work to, to get that feeling is, it's one, it's a lot harder to get to, but people often, they just like, I don't know, like I did a hundred burpees this morning along with a bunch of other stuff. And at the end I laid down, I'm just like, ah, oh, I'm exhausted, you know? Mm -hmm. But if I'm not intentional about, I don't know, like the pride, I guess, in it, you know, that deeper feeling, then oftentimes I, I might experience it, but it just kind of, whoosh, yeah, it kind of swooshes through you and it doesn't push you to do it again the next day. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you, if you have, you know, a system or even a, just a simple plan of like, Hey, when I work hard and accomplish something, I'm going to allow myself to experience that sense of accomplishment, that pride that, mm -hmm. that comes, you know, instead of just like, okay, eating the candy and feeling good, you know? And, mm -hmm. and so I would hate for somebody to go out and work their butt off and then not get to experience the, that joy and that, uh, I don't know, that sense of accomplishment that comes with it. Yeah. I, uh, I think that people that have never really exerted themselves in something, I think they don't, they don't get why people do it um, because yeah. they haven't felt that feeling. And it's, it's sad because it's an addictive feeling as well. You know, it's, a, but it, it is a, I, I always say like, if you're lacking confidence, 
you should go do something hard and accomplish it because that for me at least has built the most confidence and that's that addictive feeling you know you're at the end of a summer and you're like wow i worked 80 hours a week for four straight months you know or whatever it is if you do crossfit or if if you're a writer and you sit down and you like you just drill down into your craft the feeling at the end where you can say about yourself hey i'm the type of person that did that I'm the type of person that stuck it through mm. that feeling of self-worth is absolutely addicting in my opinion and a deep like real resounding feeling that speaks truth about who you are it's not just a it's not just an emotion but it's like an actual mm. connection to your identity and that's that's in in my view why people do those hard things because they want to feel like they are worthy. They're a good, worthy, confident person. Yeah. And I think it's funny because how many people are out there who, who do affirmations maybe, or they have their, you know, their mantras and all that, but yet don't do the work, mm -hmm. you know? And so it's almost, there's, it's like, you have the opposite. It's like, you know, because, because affirmations are designed to help move you from, mm -hmm. from one place to another. But yeah, I think there's a lot of people out there that do the affirmations without any shift or change. And so I think like what you're saying is it's important to acknowledge that maybe I'm currently not a person who works hard but I'm going to do what it takes so that I can say that so that mm -hmm. it can be my reality. Um, but it, I think it's kind of sometimes a, a gut check and it feels like a kick in the stomach when you have that guilt of like, you know, I, I say these things, this is who I want to be. These are important values to me, but am I actually doing the work? Am I actually doing what I say is important to me. And mm -hmm. if not, then you got to either take ownership, like, like you mentioned, Jocko, right? Like, accept what you see in the mirror as being the truth and either accept it or recognize that what I'm currently doing is not the person that I want to be. And so I have to make some changes. You know, I in August, I decided to like, so this time last year, when I stepped on the scale, it was 220. And I'm only five, nine with my shoes on, <laughs> which is not that big of a person. So somebody who should not be sitting at 220. And I'm not that strong, you can see my wrists are little. And so I decided to make a change, you know, and I had to go through this process. And so what I decided to do was not associated with my identity because I didn't feel like a healthy person. I didn't feel like someone who um, was fit because I couldn't do the things that I wanted to. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's been interesting because, so I, I did a completely plant-based diet plus no grain. So like no gluten, no sugar, no, like there's a lot of no's, but there's also a lot of yeses. And just recently in the last like month or so, I feel confident to tell people like, yeah, I'm a vegan mm -hmm. and I, I live a plant-based diet and lifestyle. And, you know, and, but yet I've done it for several months before where I was doing this thing, but I didn't feel like I had the identity of it until mm -hmm. more recently. Um, and so it's just, it's interesting shift that happens. Um, but I think the more mindful you are and the more intentional, the easier it happens and kind of the quicker and, you know, we all know that like your identity is the strongest source of motivation. And so, mm -hmm. you know, making that shift is always going to, I don't know, help you keep it going. Yeah. The food uh, example that you just gave is a great example. I, mine's not as dramatic, but I had a similar thing uh, doing the summer, you know, you're just walking door to door and I would usually lose a ton of weight because I was just walking and eating, you know, like hot pockets for dinner every night. Um, 
And then the last year that I went, which was two summers ago, uh, I got a Segway. And so now I'm still eating like crap. I eat, you know, like McDonald's for lunch every day <laughs> and, uh, and then a Hot Pocket for dinner. Not to mention, I had just gotten married. So my wife's like, hey, I want to try cooking all this stuff. And I'm cooking for 10. Um, so, <laughs> so I gained a bunch of weight, you know, because I wasn't walking. I was on the Segway and I was eating like crap. And I got home and I didn't, first off, I didn't even notice, you know, like that I was overweight because um, it's so gradual. Yeah. And I kind of stayed overweight until about, uh, I want to say maybe six months ago or so. Um, and so I work at a health and wellness company right now. And they are doing this thing. They were testing out these products on basically like a cleanse. And it was like, mm. a, it's an eight day cleanse. And they were testing them out. And they said, hey, we'll, we'll pay you and your wife and whoever you want to try this. Like, we'll give you like a hundred bucks just to try it. I was like, I'm getting paid to you know, <laughs> lose weight. Like, all right, fine. So me and my wife and uh, my mother-in-law, we did it. It's only eight days, but it's like, it's like very strict, you know? Yeah. Um, like you can only eat these things. You got to take these supplements. Um, and I did it and lost like 11 pounds in eight days. And my wife did. And, and since then, kind of what you were saying, it was like, it was so hard in the beginning because it was like active energy, like conscious cognitive energy saying you need to fight uphill against your habits against your cravings your urges and against your identity the biggest thing right. like i almost like i almost liked the identity of being the guy who's like i don't care about healthy stuff like i'm like the the yeah. funny guy <laughs> right. who like is eating everyone else's extra creme brulee at the end of the dinner you know like that was yeah that was reinforcing to me my personality me too <laughs> and like that's dangerous you know because um it you know it can really become who you are and then all of a sudden you know you you're you're g gaining weight without even realizing it and so the after a while the the effort and the pushing uphill of changing all these things, you know, as you start to see yourself as this person that, oh, I'm the guy who, you know, just gets water instead of root beer every time. Or, you know, I'm, I am the guy who enjoys healthy food. That's like my thing. That's my quirk. Um, yeah. When I started telling myself that kind of stuff, it got way easier. And then now, like, I don't even honestly really think that much about unhealthy food like I don't crave it I mean I have it uh, when I feel like it but I see myself as the guy who has food occasionally that's unhealthy for social reasons but since my identity shifted it my body just had to catch up you know like yeah. your, your, your life right. will always catch up to your identity yeah I think the cool thing about it too when your identity shifts it's all of a sudden because I went through this phase where it was difficult, you know, like we're having dinner with somebody and it, there's like this awkwardness of like, well, I don't want to say anything, but I also don't want to like break the diet. And so I'm like, okay, just get over it. And, and it just like shove first, food in your shirt or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, at first what happened was it was my wife that was like, you know, what, I'm going to help you. And so, and I mean, if we're honest, most of the time we're having dinner with somebody, it's like my wife's friend. Right. And so she was the one that was like, Hey, we're, you know, letting them know, Hey, just so you know, Chris is on this like crazy diet. So don't feel like you have to cater to him because he's doing it to himself. Um, but so I, I forced myself to start having those conversations and they started to get easier. Mm -hmm. And as a result, without being really intentional about it. Like, for example, like I stuck with the diet through Thanksgiving, you know, I was like, I'm not eating Turkey. Like, you know, this is who I am. This is what I'm doing. And my, my brother-in-law the day after Thanksgiving comes up to me and he's like, tell me more about your diet. Like I'm going to do it. And at this point I was down like 50 pounds, you know? So like, I'm, you know, I said, Dang. I was starting to out 
220, I'm like, I guess I've been consistent since around Christmas at uh, 165. And so, wow. um, so the weight came off really fast, but it's just like, I've stayed, you know? So, mm -hmm. and I think I'm at like a pretty good weight. Now I just need to swap that last little bit, you know, for <laughs> muscle. Stubborn, stubborn body fat. Yeah. Yeah. And I, anyway, so long story short, my, my brother-in-law, I don't even know. He's down like 50, 60 pounds. Like wow. he, I think he's down even more, maybe like 65 just since Thanksgiving. Like that's not that long. And, um, and my, my wife has started, she is not doing the diet, but she has started like exercising more and got her sister going. And now we've got this family like text thread that's going where everybody that shares awesome. like their workouts. And it's like this thing that just like, it's, it's grown organically without any effort, without like trying. The only effort was not hiding from my identity, you know, not, and, and recognizing that like, I can still go to a friend's house and eat nothing or bring my own food and tell them like make them not feel bad because look, I'm doing this to myself. I know you made steak. Everybody else is going to love it. I'm sure it's amazing. I'll come smell it for you, you know, but I'm going to stick with, you know, what I'm doing mm -hmm. and, and just kind of owning it. And it's, it's just been really, really cool to see, like, not only the transformation that it's, had on myself, but also the transformation that it's, you know, organically had on other people. Yeah, absolutely. So what's like a day of eating? What, what's like a typical, where do you get your protein from? I guess is a big question too. Well, okay. So it, it definitely takes shifts. Like, I don't, I don't know if you're okay. So with music, I go through these shifts. Like I I've gone through like a Jack Johnson phase where it's like, that's all I listened to for like a month. And then I'm like, I went through an Eagles phase. Like, uh -huh. I'm like, Oh yeah. Just, and this is, I'm talking back in the day when it was like CDs, you know, it's like, uh -huh. well, it's too hard to change the CD. I'm just going to listen to this one 500 times in a row. <laughs> And, um, and so I found that my diet has kind of done the same kind of thing. So I go through these different shifts where it's like, I just get obsessed with certain things uh -huh. for a little bit. Um, and so <clears throat> more recently I've started, like, I've got my empty cup here from, um, a smoothie. And so I've been doing, um, I don't even know what the brand is called, but my wife got these like plant-based smoothie mixture stuff. And there's like a hundred different things. And, um, and so there's a lot of, it's kind of like supplement type stuff, but then there is protein in that. Mm -hmm. Um, so more recently I've been in that kind of phase of like, you know, I'll do, um, you know, like, I don't know, peanut butter. I use the Costco peanut butter because it's peanuts and nuts and that's it. Um, and then I don't know, I'll do whatever fruit ice. Um, there's like this chocolate powder as well as plant-based, uh, protein. Um, so it's really simple, you know, it's not fancy. It's like a almond milk with, you know, all this stuff in it. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll do hummus with veggies a lot. Um, mm. a lot of, uh, you know, broccoli and, uh, I don't know, I'll, I'll saute a lot of stuff. So I'll do like sweet potato, onion, uh, and throw some, uh, spinach in there. Yeah. Uh, black, black beans, but my diet's really simple. I eat, um, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and beans. Mm -hmm. and, so, and then like spices, of course. But so if it's not on that list, then the answer is no. <laughs> yeah. I found myself eating a ton of, uh, hummus lately. I found yeah. a new love for hummus that I didn't know I had. <laughs> it's wonderful. Yeah. I know. I throw a ton of hot sauce. <laughs> yeah. 
But I, man, okay, here's the thing though. So just maybe two days ago, I posted on my story, mm -hmm. uh, uh, like the ingredients of hummus. And my wife was so excited. I felt so bad. So she comes home and she's got like four, you know, things of hummus and they're all these like fancy flavors and I'm all excited, you know, and she starts, she, she opens up this like cauliflower one. So I'm like, whoa, it's like, extra healthy, yeah. you know? And she's like, this one tastes so much more creamy than other hummus. And so she's like, I wonder if there's dairy because I don't do dairy. So mm -hmm. she's reading, she's like, oh, no dairy. And then she just gets this look of like, oh my gosh, there's sugar in it. And so she starts looking at all the other ones. Three of the four hummuses had sugar. And she's like, why? Like, like you're just, I, I guess sugar is ad addictive. And so they know that. So they're yeah. like, oh, let's secretly make this healthy thing, but throw sugar in it, you know? And hummus is one of those things that a lot of people don't look at the package to even see, you know, what's on it. Mm -hmm. And so that's been one of the biggest um, challenges as far as like gaining a new skill set of like, check the labels of every single thing that I eat. And I guess 90% of what I eat is like almost raw or like I cook it myself. You know, it's like an onion. You don't have to look at the ingredients, right. you know? Um, and so that makes it easy, but you know, salsa is another one. Like hmm. there is so much sugar in most salsa. And so I never would have like, thought of that. All these things, ketchup, ketchup is like, like tomatoes, sugar, like a smoothie, like fructose, corn syrup, <laughs> like, yeah, like it's insane. Yeah. The skill set of, uh, of checking labels is something that, uh, I've not so much labels. I, I've never counted calories before. Mm. And I was listening to a podcast and they were talking about how much, uh, protein intake, like people can be working out for years and not be making any gains. And if they change one small thing, then it can totally change the results that they get. And one of the things they said is like protein intake. Like right. people, people work out intense for a decade and don't have enough protein. And if, as soon as they shift their protein, they jump up. I was like thinking about that. I'm like, okay, yeah, that's a good idea. It seems pretty simple. And the thing was saying to do like uh, a gram of protein for every pound of weight. If you're trying to like build muscle, okay, I'll try that out. Yeah. And so I weigh like 200 pounds roughly. And so I was like, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. And then, you know, you don't, you don't really, you take a simple idea, but when you actually go to do it, it's like all these components that you never realize. It's like you were saying, you're like, well, my diet's simple. I have uh, fruits and veggies and nuts and this and that. Right. And it's like, oh yeah, that's so simple. I could do that. I'll, I'll do that right now. And then you're like, you go to get hummus like wait does this follow into the category and you go to get like a, a certain drink and then you're like oh wait no it's not almond milk it's it's normal milk and so anyway with uh with protein it's like okay 200 grams of protein so i'll do a protein shake there's 40 grams uh okay now i have to actually go onto the label and figure out how many grams are in a thing of chicken or a piece of steak or you know like a scoop of peanut butter right and you're expanding your skill set and like yeah. having to learn all these new things well plus the what else comes with it you know i think there's so much of the like i don't know the world's in like a health kick right now like yeah but the food industry is in a really manipulative place where they're like okay, we're going to make protein Cheerios, but really it's like, okay, so increase serving size, add a little bit more nuts and you still get all the extra crap. And now uh -huh. it's way more calories. Uh -huh. And so I think people forget to check like, oh, this thing's got a ton of practice, you know, a ton of protein in it. Like, you know, go for it. But the reality is like, what else is coming with it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, and you people just don't check those things matter, you know, like you, you have 200 grams of protein, but you're getting it through like a whole thing of peanut butter or something. And there's a lot of fat or whatever. Yeah. You know, like I still don't have that down, like counting. 
it's tough. It's it's a lot of effort counting calories and counting. Yeah. Well, macros. I think a really a really interesting thing that that I experienced with this this journey I've been on is so one of my good friends he started basically the opposite diet of me at the same time. And so he, he started keto like full on mm -hmm. and we experienced pretty much the exact same results. Interesting. And two years ago, the two of us also did keto together and I did it for a month. And my experience was zero energy, couldn't get out of bed, couldn't think clearly. It was like, I was forgetting stuff. I just was like, and I was doing it to a T, you know, I had all the MTC oils and I was like doing it all perfectly. <clears throat> I, I think I lost like two pounds in that month. My buddy loses like 25 pounds. He's like, <laughs> I've never had this much energy. Whoa. Like, and having this amazing experience while I'm just like, what the heck? We are eating the exact same things at the yep. same times, pretty much like doing it all the same and yet having vastly different experiences. And so mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest things that I learned is that people are different and, and you kind of can't just read stuff and do it. I think, you know, when you do science, experiment, you know, you learn in like fifth grade, like change one variable at a time, mm -hmm. because otherwise you won't know what's, you know, the cause and effect. And so I think that's really important with diet for one is like, okay, so you change one thing and then see what the effects are, you know, and then change one more thing, you know, see what the effects are. But I think the same is also true when you're talking about any lifestyle change or, or even in sales, you know, like one thing that comes up with me a lot um, with clients is the, the debate of, do I have crazy extreme goals that I can't really accomplish? Or do I set, you know, more realistic goals? And I think the answer is whichever one works, you know? Mm -hmm. So for me, keto didn't work for yeah. my friend. It totally works and he's loving it. And he's like doing all these other amazing things. Um, and he's had like a very similar experience to me where for me, it's, it's kind of the opposite. And so, you know, whether it's sales, whether it's, you know, diet, whether it's exercise, like do what gets you the results. And just because one thing doesn't work, you know, don't change the goal change the way that you're reaching out to get that goal to what is actually going to help you achieve it. Mm -hmm. um, but I see so many people doing the opposite. It's like, okay, so you, you have an objective that you want to accomplish and your strategy doesn't work. And so then they just stop completely. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that's, oh, that's like the last thing I ever want to see. That's like the nightmare, you know, like don't give up on the dream, just shift your yes. strategy for it. Yeah. It's a, the all or nothing mentality is harmful in this sense. It's like with a diet, I had this problem too. It's like, I have to be a hundred percent or not do it at all. And there's some good that comes from that mindset. Like the idea of committing the idea of really going for it that I agree with a hundred percent. But what you're saying is, is true where if you try something uh, instead of just going all or nothing, 100% or quit, like iterate, you know, like shift it, you try keto, it didn't work. That doesn't mean I'm never doing a diet again. Right? You know, like, <laughs> I tried to to grow a, a, an Instagram for my business. And this post doesn't work. I guess Instagram's wrong. I'll, I'll, I'll try <laughs> Facebook. Like, yeah, no, just shift it, you know. And um, I see this problem, too. I, I think along the same lines, of what you're saying um, is that I think people don't calibrate advice that they hear enough to themselves. Like they don't, how do I say this? It's like, they don't trust themselves to be able to put it in the context of their own life. They're like, Gary yeah. Vee, tell me exactly how to achieve my dream and I'll just do it. I don't want to think. And he says, grind 10 hours a day. Like, 
all right like i'm not even gonna i'm not even gonna think twice about yeah <laughs> that advice i'm just going for it and if people would relate the advice back to what works for them and their actual lifestyle like it's probably more in phases like you were saying like it's not yeah. as clear and certain always what you're supposed to do as instagram makes it seem yeah it, your life is complicated so if you want a goal you're gonna have to try a bunch of different stuff to be able to get there yeah one of the biggest things and most common things that I find kind of falling on my plate as far as like, you know, coaching salesmen is bridging that gap. You know, so many of them do the miracle morning. They do, you know, power hour. And, you know, my question is like, what is that giving you? Like, because I believe in all of those things, mm -hmm. but are you a slave to it? And uh -huh. it's like, you're just doing it because you read it in a book or, is it helping you accomplish something? Is it setting you up for success? And then the other thing is, how can you compile? I like to call it like the Swiss army knife. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if you're one of those people that carries a knife. Like I, no. I never have been one of those people, but you know, those people, right? Like oh, yeah. they're ready for anything. They have it on their belt. <laughs> and for some reason, situations always arise where that person's super helpful. You're like, Oh man, if I had a knife, look at me, I got this ready to go. I have a flashlight and, too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like <laughs> they just, they're ready for, for any situation. Uh -huh. And so what I do a lot of times with clients is let's not erase the miracle morning. Let's not erase the power hour or any of those other things. Let's just make a knife out of it. Like mm -hmm. let's, let's put it on your tool belt and, and carry it around so that when things are sucking and you're having a really hard time, whether it's with diet and you're like, oh, I want that ice cream or whatever it is, mm -hmm. you have a knife to pull out. Like you have a strategy in place. You have your power hour consolidated into something you can do in 30 seconds to a minute. Mm -hmm. You know, you can, uh, and, and so that's been one of the biggest things is like bridging the gap of like, one, let's take the things that work for you that are serving you from the miracle morning and just do those things. And let's maybe even try it out at night. Like I've got one client, he's like, I get so much done at nighttime where nobody's calling me because everybody else is asleep. Like the computer screen is just right there. And I just get so much done, but I feel guilty because I'm not doing the miracle morning. And I'm like, which aspects of the miracle morning can you do to set yourself up for success working at night? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he's like, Oh my gosh, like that's mind blowing. And, <laughs> but, but it's the, it's the same concept that you're saying is like people fail to recognize that you can take these amazing concepts that work for people and apply it to your own life. You don't mm -hmm. have to completely shift everything that you're doing and be like, okay, I gotta like take Jocko's wake up at 4am and, you know, and then you know, do all the different things from all the different people, you got to just like recognize where you're at first uh -huh. and then which of those things apply to you and how do they best fit in your life? And then yeah. all of a sudden, like, don't, you know, so, okay, pick which ones you're going to choose. And then if stuff's not working, don't just do a complete overhaul, change uh -huh. one thing at a time. Uh -huh. you know, I like that concept. Simple. Changing and then all the thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's like becoming a scientist of your life mm -hmm. and your productivity. Yeah. I, I really like that. The changing one thing at a time, like, uh, the advice I would give to someone who's trying to change their health with a diet is, I mean, step one, most people don't even know what they're eating. So it's not like, yeah. it's not like I need to go from I'm not even thinking about food to I am having an insane diet while I have is, you know, pomegranate juice. It's like, <laughs> okay. that's like the biggest shift in the world. Like I, the first thing I did was just like, write down what I'm eating, you know, like awareness at, at least is a step. 
Um, and that was very helpful, but it was like, it was like a, a preliminary step, you know, that's only, that's doesn't really change my life, but that got me ready to do the next thing. And, you know, then you incorporate, okay, well, now that I know what I'm eating, let's add, you know, less, let's have less sugar or let's have more protein or something like that. Um, and taking those types of steps, I feel like yeah. is much more effective. No, I completely agree. And I think it's the same with diet or any self-help book. You mm -hmm. know, if you're, if you're not looking in the mirror first, then applying any of the things are either going to fizzle out or just not work for you. Yeah. You know, and, and then think about when you look in a mirror, like let's say you're on a date or, and you, you know, I don't know, you're at a restaurant and you go use the bathroom and you look at yourself in the mirror and you've got like a big, I don't know, green chunk of spinach in your teeth, right? And your initial thought, you're like, oh man, how long has that been there? I look like an idiot, like I'm making this bad impression and, and all that. How many of you are going to just leave it in your teeth? Like, oh, that looks amazing. <laughs> Saving that for later. Like, I can't wait. Like nobody does that. Uh -huh. And so I think you have to have the same approach where when you look in the mirror, honestly, and you see that like, you know, I've got extra weight or I'm not doing things as productively as I should. I'm sleeping in, I'm going to bed late. I'm Netflixing every night, right? Mm -hmm. All these different things that, that you're experiencing. If you don't own up to them, and look at yourself in the mirror, you're not even going to be like, you didn't know that you had the spinach in your teeth mm -hmm. for one. And then two, the natural thing that happens is you pull the spinach out of your teeth. And so when you start to look at yourself and you see some of those bad habits, then you naturally want to change. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. and then, and then the books come into play. Because then it's like, okay, I want to make some changes because I see this spinach in my teeth. How am I going to get it out? Oh, okay. I'm going to read the miracle morning and I'm going to start to apply those things. But mm -hmm. if you haven't seen the spinach, then you're not going to get to that point or it's not going to work very effectively. You yeah. know, it's like having pineapple or mango, like, you know, that really, gets in your teeth, you know, and you need to get like a toothpick's not even enough. You need to get the floss and like really work to get it out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whereas spinach, sometimes you don't even need a toothpick. You just use your fingernail and you're good. Yeah. I think I, I think a lot of people, they don't want, they want a profit, you know, they want certainty and they want a profit to come into their life and tell them this is the way and just listen to me and take my hand and I'll take you to the promised land. You know, and they, yeah. they find profits in Gary V they find profits in Tony Robbins. They find, and they don't question them. And I don't think that's good. I think this is what's bad about the self-help industry. And I love the self-help industry. I've read all those books. I follow those guys on Instagram. I watch their YouTube videos, but I don't use it as a reason to not take responsibility you know, i don't use it as a reason to stop thinking i don't say tony please tell me how to think you know gary you're successful tell me and i will just do it you know and yeah. and i think i mean there's a lot of reasons for that and i think one of them that, that people don't talk about enough is that the people that are giving the advice they're giving advice, right, on things that they think are working, but it's not the whole story, even in their own life. You know, they're just yeah. trying to diagnose what's working, reduce it into very simple terms and give it to you. But, you know, if you watch, I don't know, Gary Vee, again, using that example, he's, he didn't listen to Gary Vee advice and then pattern his life after it he had a life and then <laughs> right. he looked at it and thought some of these things work. Let me help other people. And that's the same thing that you have to do. If you're listening to self-help, take it in, like you said, put it in your Swiss army knife and use it, but don't just kneel at the altar of your favorite guru <laughs> and hope that they'll take you there. 
because they don't know your life, you know? Yeah. They, and, and they're only giving you a reduced version of their advice. They're not telling you every single context of your life. And yeah. I, I don't know. I think people need to work on that. <laughs> yeah. Included. No, I, I, I mean, all of us do. And I guarantee you, so do all of the gurus. Like, I can, I can guarantee you that all of them wrote that stuff speaking to themselves. You know, like, yes, it's stuff that they applied, but they applied it because they struggled with it. Mm -hmm. You know, and they needed an answer to their problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like they're people, you know, they got there because they're people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're born a baby just like everybody else. <laughs> yeah. And no one really knows, you know, like you can get nuggets of wisdom from, from so many sources, but like no one, no one really knows. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I think, I think, I think on that note too, I think it's also important to recognize that you have the answers like that. You are the guru as well. And that mm -hmm. like, like so many people just, I don't know, they, I don't know, humility is a huge thing. And they, I don't know, look down on themselves. We're our own worst critics, mm -hmm. but in order to really create change, you've got to recognize that that you have the strengths already. Like you don't need to like, I don't know, become another person. You just need to recognize, like we talked about earlier, those pieces of your identity that'll help um, to make those changes. And, you know, and also recognize that gurus aren't the only people you can learn from. Mm -hmm. um, you can learn from everyone. I had a friend I don't know, a couple of years ago, he, he made really good friends with this homeless guy and he was posting stuff on his Instagram, like every day with this guy. And it was like amazing the wisdom that this guy would share, um, who wasn't like the typical person that you would like learn from. And yeah. so I think it's important to recognize, like, like you're talking about awareness Awareness is always the first step. Whether you're talking about resilience, mental toughness, any of that stuff, like you have to be aware in the first place. And it's, I think it's awareness of yourself, but then also awareness of like, you can learn everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, you can learn by going on a walk and not even interacting with somebody. You can learn by talking to the person at the grocery store. Like everyone's got something to offer, not just you know, the, the big authors and, and things out there. We've it's not, got yeah. value. it's not just the most eloquent that have the most wisdom. They might yeah. just be the best at sharing it. Yeah. Um, I think that the, the actual living and actually taking action. Um, I think, I mean, everyone says that that's like an obvious step. But I found in my life, I use self-help as a, uh, a tool to procrastinate, to put off doing the scary thing. I'm like, mm. okay, if I'm going to start a business, I'm going to learn everything about starting a business. And I'm going to watch all these videos and read all these books, listen to all these audio programs. And it's like, well, that's good. That's like, give, give you a little bit of foundation. And then pretty soon, you're like, okay, now go ahead, start your business. Like, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll just listen to a couple more podcasts. And it's like, <laughs> right. all right, your foundation is pretty good. You should start. Like, oh, yeah, I'll start. I'll start. But just, I just got to learn a little bit more. And I found that a lot of times I use that as a, a way of not doing that thing um, because I feel like I'm progressing. I yeah. almost feel like I'm doing it. Like I'm getting, I'm getting the dopamine back as if, because right? by learning, you feel like you're progressing, um, but you, you, you plateau pretty quick if you're not doing the thing. So it's like, yes, learn. If you want to start a podcast, go listen to some podcasts about how to start a podcast, but then go buy a microphone and, you know, do it. Right. Yeah. And then keep learning, yeah. but don't let self-help be the reason you don't help yourself. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, I think the best thing as far as like my journey getting to where I currently am is not one that I ever saw. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, so I got my master's in sports psychology. 
mm-hmm. right? So understanding um, one, how the mind of people work in order to perform, but then taking the application. So athletes don't care about research. Surprise. They don't want to learn like so-and-so in 1948 study, blah, 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 and learned that blah, 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 habit. Nobody cares about that. And, and so my, and it's funny because there's a lot of different programs out there and some are focused on the research. I was lucky enough to be in one that's like, screw the research. Let's just help people. Like they uh, need to win. Like that's their job. And so it was all about application. And I think the best thing that happened was um, I, I had this professor named Ken Revisa. This guy's like godfather of a sports psych in baseball. I don't know if you remember Jim Abbott, the like one-armed pitcher um, uh-huh. played for the, yeah. the angels for years. So he worked with him for like his whole career um, or most of it. Um, and then he ended up helping. He was on the coaching staff of the Cubs when they won the, the world series broke the curse, that whole thing. And then he passed away like a year later. And so I was really lucky enough to have this guy as like a mentor. Mm -hmm. And the best thing that he told me is like, find who you want to help and just go help them. And so I'm like in my first class of my master's, I'm like, I know nothing. And he's like, go find someone and start helping them. And so I'm like, Okay. Like I love surfing and I see the need. So I go down to Huntington beach, you know, while there's a contest going on, I'm just like, okay, I'm just going to start talking to people. And so I did. And, um, you know, met this awesome guy named Brad Edinger who, you know, sponsored by Hurley at the time. And he's just like this awesome guy. And he's like, Oh, you got to talk to my coach. He does strength and conditioning. And like, he trains us, um, you know, does all this filming, like, he would love to like, you know, talk to you. So long story short, he gives me his number and the next three years were spent working with world-class professional surfers, um, guys, you know, both amateur and professional, uh, one of, you know, several of which made it onto the world tour. One of which I'm still friends with today who was, pretty much a kid at the time, you know, in 2019, the last year before COVID, um, ended up sixth place in the world, you know, all because my, you know, professor and mentor is like, go start helping people. And so it was weird because I felt like an imposter. I'm like learning stuff on Tuesday, teaching it on Wednesday. (laughs) Yeah. You know, or even Tuesday night, I'm like, oh, guys, I learned this thing today. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you guys got to start doing it. But it became like it, it, it helped me build so much confidence, you know, because I'm like, OK, I've got this guy that works with professional baseball players, Olympians. And he's just telling me, OK, go do this you know, help them apply it, you know, to whatever it is that they're doing. And, and so, you know, with what you're saying of like action speaks louder than words, you know, and at the end of the day, you're going to screw up anyway. I mean, I think Gary V, I, what I love about Gary V is he's such a good example of like, he's just raw, he's fresh. And he's just like, you, you see what you get. There's no hidden agenda and it's just raw and uncensored. And he's like this guy at the pinnacle and, you know, and so it doesn't have to be so, uh, what's the word like catered, like it doesn't have to be so perfect. Yeah. And like manicured. Up. Yeah. And yeah. And like people, you know, they, when they're starting out, they, they kind of hide behind stuff, you know, it's mm-hmm. like, they want to have like, okay, I'm going to make a PowerPoint you know, presentation. And like, I find it all the time. Like you look at my Instagram, like the sales resilience and it's all these quotes and like stuff that I come up with, but it's words because it's like, I don't want you to see me, you know? And so I think we, (laughs) we, we all have that sense of like, I don't know, trying to hide, Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, take the imperfect action, you know, do it even though you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. I, I think that is like the best advice, but super hard to do. 
Like, yeah. It's easier. It's much easier to just. Well, and it, I think there's different strategies for the approach too. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm dating myself here, but um, I don't know if you're familiar with Martin Short. Yeah. So oh, yeah. comedian, uh -huh. you know, he was like in Father of the Bride. He's been in like a million things. So he wrote a book called I Must Say, which was from a character that he played on Saturday Night Live. And in that book, he's talking about like when he's starting out, how he didn't, he, he was so uncomfortable. He, he didn't know how to like go and do these auditions and felt like, like he wasn't going to get the role. And so what he did was like, well, who would get the role? I mean, I'm, I'm an actor. Let's just act like that person. So it was kind of like inception, right? Yeah. So you've got himself here who's acting like the person who can get the role to then act like the role. But for him, so that was the strategy that he took is what are the things that I need to do to become the person who would get the role? Mm -hmm. And it was different depending on, on the role that, that he was trying to get. And so that was one strategy that, that he used and it worked for him. I think another strategy is um, just like taking the action. So like not changing yourself or anything, but just recognizing like, okay, step one, step two, step three. Like sometimes people get like, I don't know, you have vision boards and you have the grand scheme and the big picture. And it's like, it can be overwhelming for people. Some people it's not. Some people it's like that vision board, you know, causes action. But if people are not the, that person, you know, like, okay, let's just look what, you know, five feet in front of me, like, let's approach that, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think there's a lot of different strategies that you can use to take action um, whether it's becoming another person and acting like, like Martin Short or, you know, or just doing like, I don't know, have the to-do list and don't look anywhere else. Just, okay. Step one, step two, you know, and I'm uh, sure there's a million other approaches on top of those. And people get their energy from different things, you know, like that's why the, all these approaches we keep saying, and it's the, the most annoying advice to get is it depends, but that's usually true. <laughs> You know, it's like, well, it depends because it's true. Like some people, they, they work well on a to-do list you know, they work well to get their dopamine from like, Hey, I did it. Uh, yeah. And some people, they're not that way. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I just, I just think you can't, you can't rely too much on, on one particular thing like one particular guru or anything or self-help if you're not just doing it. It's like, I had this friend that asked me about working out this was a couple of years ago. And he was saying like, Hey, do you breathe in? Um, like before you push or do you breathe in after you push or like what? And he was so wrapped up in the minutia of working out. And I was like, Hey, that's great. You know, like the difference between those top guys, you know, like a top bodybuilder, let's say, and a normal person is the minutiae, right? They, they're paying attention to detail. But I think people get bogged down in the minutiae before they take the big, easy, simple steps. So like, if you're listening to this, and you want to do something, there is a very obvious step that you should take, like you already know what it is. And if you're thinking, should I post this at 3 p.m.? Should I post it at 7 p.m.? Uh, should I have a border around my picture before I post it on Instagram? Do I breathe in? Do I breathe out? Like, just go to the gym. That's the first thing, you know, like the body of work, the 80% is the easy, the simple, just doing it. And then the details are very important but the details come after, at least that's what I found. Yeah. Well, you typically won't even know the answer until after you do it. Yeah. You know, like so you post the thing and you realize after like, Oh, that looks bad. Like, okay. So learn from it and move on. You know, uh -huh. but you didn't see that until after you posted it. Uh-huh. It's so. like a relationship, you know, like your relationship with your spouse or a girlfriend or a first date, you can't, plan out your interactions beforehand, you know, 
you can't be like, oh, okay, I'm going to knock on her door. And then I'm going to be like, so smooth. I'm going to sit, pull her chair out. And I have this joke ready. And I'm going to trick her into liking me. No, it's like, do <laughs> go on the date. How did it go? Remember that go on a second date. And I think it's, it's not that complicated to do stuff. You know, <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's, it's hard to accomplish, but it's, it's simple. It's not that it's complicated. It's just like, get out there and try. Right. Well, and it's interesting because I think, so we talked about the awareness piece, right? So taking a look at yourself is kind of a good starting place. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the, on the other side of things is another area that people fail to do. And it's looking back, like it's the reflection of the action that I did take. So mm -hmm. it's the, I'm doing keto, you know, for the next year. And then you're six months in and you've gained all this weight, you have low energy and all this stuff, but you're like, no, I'm just doing this. Like I'm committed. Uh-huh. Like and I so, have blinders on. I'm just going to yeah, do it. Yeah. Right. And, and I get that approach. Like I, I see, I understand the benefit of committing and following through. However, if the thing that you're committing to is causing problems in your life and it's not getting you the purpose of why you started that thing in the first place, then it's not serving you. Like you have become a slave to that thing mm -hmm. that is just causing problems. Yeah. And so I think, you know, if anybody is starting something new, whether it's, I don't know, all the things that we talked about already two main things to do one pay attention identify where you're at and own where you're at and then two reflect like if you're doing a science experiment and i hate to just keep going back to that but if you're doing a science experiment and you're not recording your results then you're not really doing a science experiment to begin with you know i love <laughs> I love um, Mark Rober, like my kids, you know, they're, I don't know if you're familiar with Mark Rober. So he's this YouTuber, like used to work for NASA, does these like. He's a mustache crazy... guy? No, he's, he's pretty clean shaven. Huh. Um, but all he does is like science experiments and he kind of, you know, but it's like really entertaining and, but he also gets into like the science of it. So I feel like Okay, if you're gonna watch YouTube, kids, like you can watch Mark Rover because I feel like you're at least learning something. Yeah. But one of the things is he's always messing things up. He's like, okay, well, based on the math, this is what should have happened, but it's not what happened. And so, you know, we had this result. So what we need to do is change in these few ways, right? Just these you know, simple variables. And then let's see what happens the next time. Right. And then they show you the video of whatever explosions or different things. And if you're not doing that, then you're not going to know how effective whatever approach it is that you're taking. And mm -hmm. so, you know, anybody that I work with, the two first things that I want them to start doing is one, uh, look in the mirror, Right. And there's different ways that you can do that, uh, depending whether it's diet, uh, exercise, whether it's, uh, you know, with sales and whatnot, morning routines, all that. The second thing is start to reflect. You know, some people to do a journal, some people pull out their phone and do a voice memo um, or make a video of yourself. Right. Like it doesn't matter, but record the results you know, mm -hmm. or the lack of results, like what is happening and take some time to reflect. And again, don't make it a this big thing. Otherwise you won't do it consistently. Make it super simple, super easy, something that you'll do regularly and you'll mm -hmm. do consistently. And then all of a sudden you'll find your, yourself having a transformation on this journey of enjoyment, you know, because awareness and reflection those two things are like such a huge combination to find joy in your life. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. I think um, I, I like the idea that it, David Goggins has that same idea, right? The uh, I think he calls it the reflection. What is it? The account accountability mirror. Yeah. Right. And he like goes and he's like totally honest with himself. And I love that idea. 
And I think people are resistant to this because there's a lot of movement these days for like self-acceptance, um, which I guess, let me say this, these two things are not uh, mutually exclusive. On the one hand, people think self-acceptance. And then the other hand is what we're talking about, which is um, self-reflection, being totally honest. And it's like, if I look in the mirror and I say, hey, I'm overweight. And if you think self-acceptance is not looking in the mirror and not being honest about the fact that you're overweight, that's not really self-acceptance. That's more like self-delusion. So what, in my opinion, the way you can have self-acceptance and honest reflection is you can say, hey, I, I am overweight. You know, like I can be honest because if I'm not honest, I'll never change. I can be honest about where I'm at, but that doesn't mean I have to hate myself. Doesn't mean I have to wait until I'm healthy to feel like I'm valued or to feel like I'm worth it or to be happy. I can accept this is who I am now and simultaneously be honest and want to change it. It's annoying to me that people are like, love yourself the exact way you are. You don't need to change at all. Like, well, of course you do. You can love yourself the way you are, but doesn't mean that you're not going to change. Well, you don't want to be better. Well, anybody that says that doesn't acknowledge that you're constantly changing just because of time and age. And so yeah. I, I get that. And even if you're going downhill, like, yes, you should still love and accept yourself. Mm -hmm. And, and I think there's also something valuable in understanding that like recognizing that maybe I don't want to change right now. Like I'm in a place of, I don't know, with whatever's going on in my life, I'm not in a position to make changes mm -hmm. and I'm still okay. Be, if you're honest about that, what's wrong with that? Yeah. yeah. But yeah. being, it, not telling yourself the truth is never, like, I cannot think of a context in which I look at my overweight body and say like, oh, I'm not actually overweight. You can say, hey, I'm overweight <laughs> okay. and I'm okay with that. Like, it's not a priority to me or I, I don't have the time to change. Or honestly, like, I just don't care. I feel fine. Like, it doesn't bother me. Th those are all fine. Yeah. But what I don't like is the like, Oh no, no, no. This is, this is the ideal. This is the, this is, I'm not even overweight or I'm not even whatever right. your goal is, you know? Yeah. And I think sometimes people also have the delusion or they get stuck with like, they just focus on one thing of, of their life. And that thing dictates you know, where just a minute ago, you said um, something about priorities, like being honest with yourself and acknowledging that like, okay, so fitness and health is not a priority right now, but what is your priority? Like, let's focus on that because if you're not focused on your health and stuff, maybe you're focused on your finances. Maybe you're focused on your family. Maybe you're focused on, yeah. uh, you know, something else that's taking precedence that is important. That yeah. is growth. That's you know? fine. It, yeah. But I think a lot of times, like just in the self-help world, we, people get stuck looking at, you know, there's kind of like the big, you know, I don't know, education, health, exercise, mindset kind of things. Whereas maybe those things aren't important to you, mm -hmm. but yet being a good father and listening to your children and asking them questions every day is the priority and it is important and you are nailing it mm -hmm. like awesome you know yeah, don't go don't, for it don't think that you're sucking in every aspect of your life just because you're like not doing this one thing that you maybe wish that you were doing yeah the big one is finances like yeah we've said gary v so many times it just always comes to mind and it's like um <clears throat> you know i personally it, it's valuable to me to like control my finances or have ambition or make money investments, those types of things. Cause it's, it's interesting. And I like it uh, just from an interest perspective. And also I find it to be very important, but like uh, some people, they, they don't care. And that doesn't matter. Like 
one of the things there's a quote by Gary Vee and he's talking about, you should like, I, I never watch house of cards. You know, I don't spend my weekend skiing. I'm hustling. I'm building a business and anyone can do it. And I'm like, yeah, anyone who wants to build a business, that's great advice. But the priority, if, if you don't care about that, like if you are a, a film student, you should not neglect your passion for building a business. You should be watching movies. You know, you should be critiquing right. them. And so I think when you hear this advice, you know, or, or I often get people say things like this about my podcast, even they're like, well, that doesn't really apply to me. Um, you know, like it's too singular, your advice. It's about one specific topic. And you're right, because that's something that I'm interested in, like health. I'm giving advice on that. But people that that's not their priority, you don't have to feel guilty for being overweight if you don't care about that, if, if your priority isn't right. that. Like, right. I'm only talking to people who do care and you have to be honest if you do care. The worst type of person is the person who says, I don't care. I'm not overweight. I'm totally fine. Who cares and who wants to be fit? That's You don't want to be that guy because yeah. then you're lying to yourself and you don't feel good about yourself and you're not taking the action because you're telling yourself, no, I, I'm not. I'm not overweight. I'm fine. But it's like, I don't know if you could just be honest, like if you come to the conclusion that you don't care and you honestly come to that conclusion, I'm so happy for you. I don't care about a lot of stuff. <laughs> like most things I don't give a crap about, like my fashion, you know, like some people would look at me and be like, oh my gosh, dude, if you would take 10 minutes a day and just think through the clothes that you're wearing. Like you would transform your life and they're probably right, but it's just, I just don't care. You know, it's like not yeah. my priority. Well, it, it's so funny. Cause I don't know, like I'm the same way. I'm like, what's on top. Yeah. Open the drawer. That's top pants. That's top shirt. Okay. We're done. <laughs> like, <clears throat> like it's, it's the priority is that I don't have to think about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But, but I think it's important for people just to acknowledge that. And I think there's also something to be said about, um, it, it, there's a gap sometimes between um, what is a priority and what people value, because sometimes people want certain things to be a priority, but it's not. And so I think that's where it gets yeah. dangerous, where it's like, like, I, I wish that I was someone who worked mm. out every morning and I wish that I ate healthy and I wish that I, you know, was this hard worker, you know? So it, like what those people do is important. So they do see that, but then there, there's a gap between their reality and it's mm -hmm. like, ah, yeah, I just can't do that. You know, like, I don't know how many times with like the vegan diet, like, oh man, like mad respect, like, but I could never. And I'm like, yeah, I was that guy less than a year ago. Yeah. You know? know. And so yeah. I think we all have different things. And I, I think of two um, people who have talked about that, like, um, so one, I just finished, uh, Matthew McConaughey's book, Green Lights. Oh, I've heard um, it's good. I haven't read which, it. Which, oh man, I, I would highly suggest the audible simply because he reads it and he's oh. amazing. And one of the things that I'll, I'll, um, paraphrase because I don't have it written down in front of me, but he, he says something like, and I'll do my best impression. Um, he says, um, I'd rather get two A's than five C's or something like that. Right. And, and he's basically talking about like being really good at two things in his life than just like being average ac across the board. Yes. And he actually had to make 
really strategic moves where he quit doing certain things to focus on other priorities of his mm-hmm. life. Yeah. Um, and then talking about uh, um, Martin Short again, in his book, he talks about how he, he had these, I don't even remember the specifics. I, it, I read that book like 10 years ago, but he has a list of things that he gives himself a grade, kind of like a like a school grade, right? So you got like an A, B, C, D, and an F. Um, And so he would have like family, friends, hobbies, work, um, you know, fitness, all these things that are important Mm -hmm. to him. And he's like, every week I got an F, at least on one thing where Mm -hmm. I either didn't do it or I did it really sucky. Mm -hmm. And then, but every week I got an A on something. And so I think both those things, right, whether it's Matthew McConaughey's approach or Martin Short's approach, they're acknowledging that I'm going to do well at something and I'm going to do poorly at something based on my priority. And so if you fail to reflect, then you're not going to change. You're just kind of going to live your life and uh, whatever you're good at that week just so happens to be what you're good at and whatever you're sucking at just so happens to fall that way. Yeah. Whereas if you take a slightly more effort, just a little bit of a more systematic approach and recognize that, okay, what I've got going on in my life right now, I need to be a super good father this week. You know, like maybe I noticed my 14 year old struggling. Okay. So I'm going to not be as good at focusing on my health or my, my exercise. Right. But then next week, okay, there's a shift. Mm -hmm. So you just, you allow yourself the freedom and the flexibility within the confines of one, your, your reality and two, the, the rules that you've set for yourself, you know, because you have to have some restrictions, Yeah, you know, whether, whether it's diet, whether it's, you know, whatever habits it is. But at the end of the day, it's like, you're not quitting completely because Mm -hmm. like, ah, screwed up. You know, it's like 75 hard. You can start over all the time. Um, you know, it doesn't mean, uh, just quit. Yeah. Yeah. It means start over, start fresh. I think, um, I mean, I like what you say about priorities. It's tough because that's kind of one of the big questions, you know, as you get older and this is where that there's all the voices, you know, what is the priority? And like, I can't tell anyone what the priority is. Uh, I always just say like, you probably already know. And it's not, I really like what you said. It's not what you want to want all the time. You know, it's what you actually value, not what you want to value, but what you actually value. Like look at the things that you do and you'll know what you already value, you know? Um, And I think the focus thing is big too. Uh, That one's hard. Like when you become a a dad and you know, you've got kids that are growing up, I just have a little baby and it's like, there, there's a bunch of people telling you, Hey, you need to, you need to focus on being a dad and not, you know, like any of your own pursuits or pursuits of the ego. And if they don't relate back to how are you helping your family and how are you helping your kid, then they're not worthy of your time and they're not noble. And I don't think that's true. You know, like I always hear people saying, you listen to Kanye West and he's like, well, I'm just trying to like build a bigger life for my family. It, really? That's why you have like a kajillion dollars and you're always gone and you have like 10 houses. You did that for your family. And it's like, no, it did that for myself. And when, if you were to say that, that sounds better. And I think if people were just honest with, and this goes for me, you know, I hate to be too preachy. If I could just be honest about why I want things and what I actually want, you know, it's a much easier to decide how to spend your time. I want to spend time with my kid. I want my family. That's a big part of my life, but I want to do things just for myself. I want to, I want to look good so that people think I'm cool. You know, like that, that's like a part of life. You know, it's like, 
but people just won't be honest about that stuff. They, they, they want to sound noble. And so they always say, Oh, everything I do is for my family, you know, or, and then they end up being resentful that they're, they never chase their dreams or they are unhealthy or whatever, because they won't just tell themselves what they really want, you know? Yeah. And I think it is a struggle because sometimes those things can seem contradictory, you know, like, I don't know. I think of Jocko's book, um, dichotomy of leadership. It's like, there's a divide that, that happens when you have different priorities. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes you have to acknowledge that and going back to, um, you know, Martin Short's idea of like failing at something every week and being successful at something every week, you've got to realize that like, you, you're going to have sometimes where, yeah, maybe you get four A's and, and one F or four A's and one B, you know, and then there's weeks that you're like F's across the board. Like, it doesn't mean that, you know, you can't change. And I think that's where it gets tricky for people is recognizing the balance of seemingly conflicting, mm -hmm. uh, you know, priorities. Yeah, I think a balance that is hard to strike too is the enjoying your life, doing things that you like, finding joy, finding playfulness, finding delight and purposeless activity. You know, like playing with a kid is not like there's no amount of discipline necessary. It's just like fun and frivolous. Yeah. And like, and the opposite which is, you know, discipline, routine, mental toughness, resilience, planning, goals. And this is another one of those things that I kind of <laughs> stubbornly refuse to believe that they're mutually exclusive again. You know, it's like, I honestly believe that you should and can find the light and, and purposelessness and fun and joy doing these little things that have nothing to do with your goals and your life feels like a cute story right. and you can be disciplined and you can do things you don't like intentionally. And it's not like you, you're not just one way, you know, like, yeah. I don't know. I, I, I think this is another thing that's come from the self-help world is people are forcing themselves to be disciplined so much that they're like, they wake up and they're like, I've been doing this for a year and I don't even like this. Like I don't found things that I like. And then they swing the other way and they're like, okay, I guess I'll just like do nothing and smoke weed and just like do whatever. <laughs> and it, yeah, I don't know. I just feel the need to say that. I don't think that those things are mutually exclusive. Like if you want a life, a life has components of both. You have to be striving towards an ideal future by doing things you don't want to do today, but also you're alive today. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think how many times do people give the, the time I, I like the, the children example, you know, like how many, how many times, and I'm speaking to myself when I say this, but you're, you're so regimented and structured, and then you go and spend time with your kids but then that time isn't spent in frivolous play, you know? And then your wife tells you like, man, what's wrong with you? You're like so ornery. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, because it, you're not even there. Like you're not even, you've, you've assigned this time to be mm -hmm. spent to like be playful and, and joyful and, you know, let whatever happen, happen. And, um, you know, and you love that time, but then you're not even doing that because in the back of your head, you're like, Oh, well, I got to do these 10 things and I'm missing out on my goals. I could be grinding right now. Yeah. And so I think sometimes there's, you know, people also struggle with that shift, you know, between like, it, it's hard to let off the gas to, I don't know, people, I don't know, they don't, they're not stopping at the rest stop to go and like play. Mm -hmm. Instead, they're, they're still driving, but they're trying to spend time with their kids. And, and, and they think it's, yeah. there's like a toxic idea that the, the playful side of this 
is somehow like weak. You know, it's like, I don't need rest. Like I, I never stop. Um, and my goals are so, I don't want to be mediocre. And I am like, I, I am just as, you know, I'm, I'm in the boat of like, go as hard as you can. I'm in the boat of work. Don't be mediocre. Uh, chase your dreams. Those types of things. Like you don't, you don't have to, you don't have to explain that to me. I think that those things are, are beneficial to each other. I think people that don't take the time, it's like a bodybuilder. It's like you go to failure every single day, you work out for five hours and you never rest. You, you're not actually going to grow. Um, and so it's in your best interest. If you are a type a, I want to be the baddest mother freaker to be playful and creative and still you know, and peaceful. It's actually in your best interest. The harder you want to get, the more still you have to get at certain times. And I don't know. Yeah. It's funny. I've got this friend, her name's Christy Brewer. And so she's got an interesting story, basically went from CrossFit to weightlifting and in a very short amount of time, um, became world-class. Oh, Um, yeah. Like, I mean, she was like, you know, executive, like at this tax firm, like, you know, doing all the financial stuff, you know, started CrossFit because of priority shift and and all that. And then basically making it to be part of the, the U S team in weightlifting. And one of the things that's so interesting is like, I mean, go check out her Instagram. I guarantee you there's going to be a post within this last week where she's like dancing, like in, you know, in the process of like, you know, doing her warm up to Mm -hmm. do a very hard thing, like a very, like, and you think of weightlifting, weightlifting is like, it's like the biggest, the strongest, the hardest people. And yet she's like off the side dancing, Uh you know, and, (laughs) and is elite level, Mm -hmm. you know? And so I completely agree with you on that, that like, if you're going so hard in one direction, like you're gonna falter, like there's, there are other aspects to life that are, you know, that you're going to miss out on. Mm -hmm. And there's other aspects to that specific direction you're going. Like you said, um, you know, like if you're trying to be like the biggest entrepreneur, like Elon Musk, right? Like ultimate entrepreneur, everyone wants to be Elon Musk. Do you really think that Elon only reads self-help? No, he, he, he reads, I mean, if you listen, he reads fiction, you know, he reads books about energy. He reads books about that science fiction and, and stuff. And cause that fosters creativity. And so like, if you are so focused on a goal, a lot of times you do worse at getting that goal because you don't notice all the opportunities around you. Um, I noticed this yeah. with, uh, with dating too. Some of my friends, <laughs> I think it's so funny. I have friends that are like, you know, get home from their mission and they're like, I need to get married. I was not that way at all. I'm like, no, I'm taking it easy. Um, ironically, I actually did get married pretty quick. Um, but they're like, I need to get married. So I got to find the one. And so like, I'm going to this party and I'm going to talk to girls so I can marry one of them. I'm like, oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and they're so focused on that goal. Like one of these girls is the one (laughs) they'll go talk to a girl and she'll be like, Oh yeah, whatever. I'm vegan. I I don't think I see myself marrying a vegan. Okay. Then I'll go to a different girl. (laughs) Like, Oh yeah, I don't, I don't know. Blah, 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 whatever. And they're just like, you know, they're bouncing around like, Oh, what a stupid party. Meanwhile, all the other people who weren't doing that, who weren't so focused on one particular outcome, made friends with everyone and they were having fun at the party and it was relaxed. And then they met someone casually and then they're, Oh yeah, we should hang out again. And then their wife was in that group and then they ended up getting married. And the person that was so focused, they're like, 
they're missing stuff right in front of them. And I think that that's true yeah. in, a, in a lot of instances. It's like, if you can be too, I don't know, I don't like the word focus because focus, in my opinion, is almost always good. You can be too uh, narrow, myopic yeah. in the way you see the world. You can be as focused as you want, but you should expand what you look at because other things are going to help with your goal. Yeah. It's, I think a, a really good analogy for that is with like a baseball player, some like some specifically a batter, right? A, a batter needs their focus as far as vision goes to be on the ball. Right. Mm -hmm. If they're, you know, worried about like what, what the base runners are doing and they're not watching the ball, then the likelihood of hitting it is very low. Mm -hmm. However, a lot of times when they shift their focus from eye on the ball to like, I need to get a hit or I need to hit in this direction or I need to, right. It's like the outcome that they're after as opposed to the process. Mm -hmm. And then what happens typically is they get really tight right? So their, their body responds to, I need this thing, right? And it's a high pressure situation. And so now all of a sudden they're clinched up and the ball comes and the reaction time is slower, right? Mm -hmm. And so now all of a sudden less likely to hit the ball. Mm -hmm. And, and so I think what you're saying is a lot of times we, we get to focus on the outcome that we lose focus on the process. Mm -hmm. And so when, like with dating, the process is be yourself, talk to people, have a good time, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and be open to whatever is going to happen, like to yeah. whether you meet somebody or you don't, like, cool. Um, you know, and then going back to the baseball analogy, you acknowledge the process and then all of a sudden your body's able to relax those muscles, you know, can kind of chill for a minute. And then when the ball comes, your reaction time is on point, you know, maybe you don't hit the ball, but your likelihood of hitting the ball has just gone through the roof. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. I like that. Cause focus yeah. has just a lot of elements to it. You know, focus has, has to do with your vision. It has to do with your hearing. Like I could be sitting here staring out the window, but not even see anything that's out the window. My head could be what I'm focused on and it could be focused on my family. It could be focused on work stuff. It could be, I don't know, daydreaming. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it could be listening, right? To, to just hear something like, so focus is really interesting because there are so many different moving pieces. And I think a lot of times we just think of it as like, I don't know, like just what we're going after, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to all these other moving pieces. And people, they, they clutch a little too hard on, uh, on the way they thought things were going to go when it comes to focus as well. And this is kind of touching on what we already talked about, but like they're, they're so determined to do keto. I think that was the example, right? That they're, they're, they're so narrow that they think, Hey, this is the way. And they don't allow themselves to pay attention to, Hey, is this working? How does my body reacting? Stuff like that. Yeah. Um, Hey, I, I've absolutely loved chatting. Um, I could talk all day. Um, yeah, same here. <laughs> we definitely got to do this again. Uh, someone who's listening, how can we support you? How, what can we, what can, where can we find you and follow? And if someone wants to be your client, I want to make sure anyone listening can be in touch with you and, and help you in any way. What's the best way that we can do that? Yeah, I think just reach out, you know, if, if it's on Instagram, um, shoot me a DM. Like, I'm not shy to shoot people my phone number. Like, I, I love human interaction and connection. Um, and like this conversation, I love talking. Um, sometimes I talk too much, but <laughs> um, like, just re reach out, you know, shoot mm -hmm. me a message uh, on Instagram. That's probably the easiest way to connect. Um, 
if you're thinking like, you know what, I want to get like a scheduled time, like let's talk my, there's a link in my bio. That's like just to my calendar, you know, to, to get a spot, you know, it doesn't cost anything. It's just like, Hey, let's get a 30 minute call going. Mm -hmm. Um, and whatever it is that you're going through, like my primary focus right now is door to door salesman. Um, but you know, like I'm, I'm open to <laughs> all kinds of different opportunities. So, and what is it be that a stranger. you do? What is it like if I'm a door to door salesman, what, what, what do you offer? Yeah. So I do coaching. Um, I currently am just doing, well, I guess I, I do both group coaching and training. Um, I do like keynote speaking, um, as well as one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, okay. so and I've is got that a lot of clients. Sales? Is that, uh, like sales coaching or is that like more mindset life <laughs> coaching or both? So I try to narrow the gap between people's reality and, uh, what they want to accomplish. So, okay. because a lot of people have big goals and they, they have the tools, they have the strategies to accomplish them, but they don't, you know, they don't put them into process. And so I just help people come up with the strategies and then follow up on, um, implementing those strategies. So if somebody, you know, so a lot of it is mindset stuff, but a lot of it is also just simple strategies. You know, I was talking to somebody earlier today, like one of the big problems is, is they might go back to their car right now. It's not, it might be cold in the morning. So they've got their jacket on. And so, you know, then they get hot and so they're like, okay, I'll take my jacket to the car. And then they're there for the next hour. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it, we came up with a simple strategy of like, okay this is a game. I'm going to do this so fast, right? I'm going to unlock the car, open the door, throw my jacket in, and then run 10 feet the opposite direction. Uh -huh. Right. And, and okay, let's try it. Does it work? Okay. If it does do it every time, if not, okay, let's adjust fire and come up with another strategy. Mm -hmm. And so, um, that's kind of the game that I play is understanding like where you're currently at, where you want to go, what are the obstacles in your way? And let's just, let's just play with it. Let's make strategies. Let's try them out. If they work awesome, if they don't, let's try something new. Love it. That's awesome. Well, uh, sales resilience is the name of your Instagram, right? Yep. Yeah. Good I've got a there. personal one. So if people do want to see pictures of my kids and stuff, um, you know, there's like Chris Pierce or it's like Chris underscore Pierce, but for any of this kind of stuff, it's yeah. Sales resilience. So if they, if they're, if they're looking more for surfing stuff, they should probably go to the personal one, right? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. I need to post more surfing stuff on there though. I'll, I'll shoot you that picture though on that weird board that we were talking about. Earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Send that my way. That Where do you fun. live in? You said you live in Hawaii. Yeah. So we've been, oh man, this is, I'll try to keep this rant nice and short. Uh, okay. So we, uh, we left Hawaii, Hawaii with COVID was crazy. And they're like, you can't go to the beach. You can go to the beach. School's closed. Like it was just chaos. Mm -hmm. And so we're like, well, let's just go. So we bought a giant, big old green 15 passenger van in Seattle and we've driven it all over the country and, you know, seen a bunch of friends and family that we haven't seen in a long time. And, um, we're currently in Georgia. We got to Georgia where, so my, uh, my wife's sister and her family, they just live like a mile down the street and they're like, COVID doesn't even exist here. Kids go to school, no masks. Like it's just normal life. We're like, let's do that. And so we've been here for the last couple of months. And so the kids are enrolled in school and have friends, they're playing lacrosse and it's just like kind of normal life. And so, um, we're, we're heading back in the end of, uh, April back to Hawaii to, cause we're, we're like living out of a suitcase for the last like 10 months. And, uh, it's been an awesome adventure. I love um, so, that. I, yeah, so I actually, over. I talked about doing that with my wife. Um, I was like, we should, I actually, yesterday of all days, we're like, we should get a camper and just 
go and like go visit people and drive around and all that stuff because it's just so something really romantic about it i don't know it's cool just like we we can be here tomorrow we live in this van oh i think it's awesome maybe not forever yeah but it's yeah. a really cool thing to try no i mean we've and we for a long time for six months of the trip we were sleeping in the van like every night and mm -hmm. it's kind of cool because it's not it's not an adventure van. Like it's not set up with beds or anything. The cool thing is that w with the amount of rows and there's no seat belts, it's like, it's an O2. So it's just bench seats. So each one of us has basically a built-in bed. And so it's kind of like, you've got your clothes, you've got your, all your stuff. That's like your bedroom. Uh -huh. um, and anyway, <laughs> it's, it's, like, and so I think there's pros and cons to everything. It was an awesome adventure. We're really excited to get back to Hawaii, yeah. you know, and like, you know, join our community again, but, mm -hmm. um, kind of, you know, plant those roots and try to get back to normal life. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, we've got I'm trying to think, I, I think I leave, uh, April 29th is my ticket out there. So yeah. what are you Maui? I'm excited for that. So we're on Oahu. So we're up okay. on the North shore, you know, living the dream. Uh, you know, I'm like within a couple miles of some of the most famous surf spots in the world. And it's, it's lovely. That's <laughs> awesome, man. Well, I'm super jealous. So, uh, well, come out and visit, you know, that the coolest thing about living in, in Hawaii is people go there all the time, mm -hmm. you know? And the worst thing that ever happens, and for some reason it happens all the time. Like I see people's photos that they were like, literally like, there's this spot called Shark's Cove that I can see from my, like from the porch and people post pictures. I'm like, I can see where you were, mm. you know, like, Hey, let's grab lunch or something. And they're like, Oh, that was last week. Uh, I didn't post anything while we were there. Like, like. I could have walked there in like two minutes and you didn't come say hi. Oh, I know you have your life and you know, I didn't want to interrupt things. And like, we're friends. Like <laughs> I'm happy to interrupt my life to see you, you know? So yeah, you know, well, when I'm at Sharks Cove, I'll, I'll DM you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> or just let me know that you're coming out we can, schedule it you know yeah for be sure. awesome well i appreciate you jumping on um sales resilience anyone listening and let's do it again man i i loved it it's great talking to you yeah yeah it was it was a lot of fun i'm i'm excited to to grow a relationship and you know have another one of these awesome conversations